Dear Mr. Nordhoff, I cannot describe my mood when I learned of your departure. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir. Es würde mir zu Gewissheit. Gottes Wille kennt kein Warum. I accepted it as fact. God's will knows no why. Ich wollte tapfer sein, das Unvermeidliche tragen und doch musste ich unterlegen. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, aber es in Ihrem Interesse liegt. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. Dear Miss Laube, our correspondence has reached a point beyond which it can only be advantageously conducted if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other. And this condition forces me to decide whether I, for the first time in my life, should trust a person with things that I have heretofore kept for myself at the very depths of the shrine of my heart. Wir leben in einer schweren Zeit. Trug und Schein verhüllen die Wahrheit. Alle Menschen tragen irgendwelche in hard times. Swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity show up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed, if one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true and noble. Hi, my name is Scott Baker, and I teach German at UMKC. Today I'm going to talk about three different topics that I bring to this project. Uh, the first is historical drama and what a history play is. Uh, secondly, the idea of the epistolary, uh, that is literature that includes letters inside of it. And finally, I'll talk about some of the problems of translation that we encountered in this project. So, first of all, when we try to define what historical drama is, we run into a couple of big problems. Simply setting events into the past, or using historical events and people as the content of a play, does not automatically make a play into a history play. The film Titanic is a good example. It portrays events that happened, and many of the characters were people who were documented to be on the ship's voyage. But the movie is primarily a love story and a tragedy that uses historical events to add impact to its story. The historical events themselves do not interest or influence the viewer. By contrast, historical drama ought to interest us in the historical events themselves. In fact, the point of a history play is to communicate something about the past to viewers who are interested in connecting those events with their own lives or their own historical present. We usually recognize Shakespeare as the most important pioneer in the creation of historical drama as its own genre. Shakespeare wrote a series of eight plays that dramatized the lives of the kings who lived through the War of the Roses, a feud between two aristocratic families that took on the proportions of a civil war. The British Queen, when Shakespeare was writing these plays, was Elizabeth I. She was descended from the victorious kings who were feuding during the War of the Roses, and Shakespeare arguably wrote the plays in order to provide a popular form of legitimation for the queen, who was also his benefactor. So the intention of these history plays was to show how the past connected to the present in a very important and political way. Or in other words, the events and people themselves were the important part of the play not some unrelated story that used historical setting as a backdrop. Conveniently, Shakespeare also wrote plays set in history that are not classified 
as historical drama for exactly this reason. Plays like Julius Caesar and Macbeth focus on the tragic flaw of their main hero, and the fact that both men actually lived in the past has no significant importance for our understanding of these plays. We can see that by this definition, or by using Shakespeare as our defining example, history plays can easily serve ideological goals. And this leads us to our second big problem, that even though historical drama uses factual events and people, it is never required that these playwrights be completely accurate. As works of fiction, historical drama can accommodate extra people who were not actually involved in historic events, and they can change people and events in order to make their story more dramatic, even though things did not actually happen the way these playwrights show them to have happened. Georg Büchner provides an important example of how this can work. Büchner was a radical Democrat living in the German state of Hessen during the 1830s. He wrote a play called Danton's Death about the French Revolution. He wanted his audiences to reevaluate Robespierre, who had been demonized as a bloodthirsty revolutionary. Büchner, however, was influenced by Robespierre's ideas about the legitimate use of violence against tyranny. One of the groundbreaking elements of this play is that Büchner extensively used quotes from both Robespierre and Danton. The authenticity of their speeches was supposed to be heightened by the fact that these historical persons had, in fact, spoken the words themselves. But although they did say these words and phrases, Büchner also rearranged and added to these quotes. So even when a historical play seems to be historically accurate, it is always important for the audience to remember that the playwright is not held to any standard for historical accuracy, and that the playwright is trying to persuade us about the relevance of historical events for our present. Büchner was an early forerunner to documentary theater, a kind of play that became very popular in Germany in the 1960s. By taking the text of their plays directly from printed sources of what historical figures said, just as Büchner had done, these plays tried to heighten the sense of accuracy in their plays. But of course, these modern playwrights also took liberties with factuality in the service of dramatic tension. Our play is also both a history play and a documentary play. We used excerpts from the correspondence between Hilda and Roland that dramatize both their unfolding romance with one another and their changing interactions with the social realities of Nazism and the war. In order to make their exchanges more dramatic, we reorganized what they said, mashed together things they said in different letters, and even made up lines and characters so that the story would flow better. And of course, we also hope that you will see the ways that we believe their story relates to problems of our contemporary world. But this is a play written on the basis of a correspondence, a correspondence in letters. Letters have been used in all kinds of literary and other texts since the beginnings of writing. One example is the epistolary books in the New Testament of the Bible, Paul's speeches to the Romans, for example. The word epistle comes from the ancient Greek word epistol, which simply meant message. St. Paul's epistles took the form of what today we would probably call an open letter or a letter to the editor. That is, a public statement about the letter writer's beliefs that he wanted to communicate to as large an audience as possible. As people became more literate and conditions like adequate roads and post offices became increasingly better, letter writing became more popular among private individuals. This kind of letter was no longer a public expression of beliefs, but rather an intimate expression of sentiments toward another person. Although letters were continuously written with other intentions as well, it is the love letter that becomes connected with literature so closely. This peaks in European literary traditions in the 18th century. Now the letter inside of a work of literature is supposed to represent authenticity and sincerity. The letter writer is providing secret knowledge, information that no one else knows but the person to whom he's writing. 
And this information is entirely emotional, so it is heartfelt and honest, the most authentic presentation of someone's inner self that can possibly be imagined. The 18th century saw the development of epistolary novels, books that consisted entirely of letters between people who wanted to share their passion for one another and get to know one another without the usual trappings of social manners that tended to get in the way of expressing oneself sincerely. One of the most famous novels that included letters to exactly these effects was Johann Wolfgang Goethe's The Sufferings of Young Werther. The title already tells us that we will be experiencing the emotions of the title character, and the form of the letters lets readers know that these emotions are truly coming from Werther's soul. There's evidence in the correspondence between Hilda and Roland that they were both acquainted with Goethe's novel, 150 years after it became the first best-selling novel of Europe. One of the reasons that Werther continues to be read to this day is its sincerity and its passion. While Roland seems to prefer the more civic-minded letters of the great men, like Bismarck and Frederick the Great, he creates many of his letters more along the model of Werther, especially as the courtship proceeds closer and closer to their marriage. Letters in literature also serve to point toward the constructed nature of writing. When we read a book or watch a play, we often get caught up in the events that we are seeing or visualizing, and we can easily forget that these events are made up. When we come across a character reading a letter, we can recognize that the letter was written for a specific purpose. In the instances I've been talking about, for the purpose of convincing someone of the letter writer's feelings toward him or her. We recognize that careful thought went into choosing the right wording and the order of ideas the letter writer wants to pre present. The play we are watching or the novel we are reading is no different. An author created that work, intending to provoke responses. So when we see letters in literature, they are a reminder that we are required to be attentive, attentive readers and attentive audience members, and that we ought to evaluate the intentions of the characters in order to better understand the literary work in which they appear. Translation always requires negotiating the line between accuracy and accessibility. A word-for-word -word translation is almost never accessible because one language not only uses different words to express an idea that can be expressed in another, but also uses words in complex ways that include cultural norms and social practices. But if we would create the most accessible translation, it would be more of a paraphrase than an actual translation. To be entirely free of the origins in another language and culture would mean not being restricted by that original document in the new language. Thus, a translation is always a new text and different from the original, not simply because it has now been rendered in a new language. We want translation, however, to also stand for as accurate a rendering of the original text as our new text can be. This process thus always requires a flexibility between creative and accurate renderings. One example that came up in the letters is the German verb prüfen, which means to test or to examine. As we look at those two options for the word in English, we can see how similar they are, interchangeable even. But Hilda and Roland use the verb in regards to themselves as individuals and in regard to their relationship. And they do this in several different letters over time. So context changes as the letter writers are in a different period of their relationship and are asking one another either to test themselves or are cajoling one another into testing their relationship. I want to show you a couple of examples from the letters themselves. And these are both from the early part of the correspondence and have to do with Roland and Hilda asking each other to examine themselves, examine their 
um, desires, uh, examine their intentions, um, and examine their willingness to engage in or to begin in a courtship. So here, the original German, Gehen Sie die Geschichte Ihrer Liebe durch, prüfen Sie ehrlich, we've translated it as review the history of your love. We've added Miss Laube to, um, because they of course didn't need those uh, ad moments of address, but as we split the text into speech acts, we wanted to be clear who was talking to whom. So, review the history of your love, Miss Laube, and examine it honestly. We felt that testing your love in this context was not what Roland was actually trying to say. Instead, he wanted her to look it over, um, examine whether her personal history of her love, her feelings for Roland, were authentic or not. Here's an example from one of Hilda's letters. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, ob es in Ihrem Interesse liegt, dass wir uns näher kennenlernen, uns prüfen. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. And in this instance, Hilda is asking Roland if he is ready not to test himself, not to examine himself and his own motivations or willingness, but rather to test the idea that they get to know each other closer, that they continue with their correspondence and that the correspondence will become more and more intense, more and more emotional. And so in this instance, it seemed to us that they were testing the idea rather than examining their own person. Now, we were able, as we went through the letters, to then return to this idea of the two different ways that we translate this particular word. And so we could more accurately or more consistently translate the verb on the basis of the context in which it was used. There's other vocabulary that reappears over the course of the letter writing, which it was fairly straightforward to decide on one particular translation. And there are other words that really never had such a concrete context that we could always say, well, it's going to be like this. And of course, these are two idiomatic speakers. So they are conversing even in the, within the restrictions of formal guidelines for letter writing and even formal guidelines for writing love letters. They are still speaking to one another. And again, over time, this grows in a very intimate way, in a very colloquial way. So the, although there are passages where they write very formally, it is more characteristic of them to write in a way that probably resembles the way that they spoke to one another and the way that they spoke to people around them. And rendering that kind of language always requires that we adapt its cultural and social expectations and norms into the language that we're translating into so that our choice of words is always as accurate to the language as it can be, but also more accurately depicts what they were trying to communicate to each other. Since we had four different people working independently on the translation, it was important to have a final reading that determined the best choice of words and hopefully be as consistent as possible while remaining to uh, accurate to that context that was originally created by the documents themselves. So that 
rereading picked out those difficult words and those words that were repeated and tried to most consistently choose a single word for rendering that whenever possible. But the most important intention of the translation was to create a text which will be understandable to contemporary English speakers as they watch the play.